This is the Investor Connect Kiwi Tech 2022 podcast series. In this series, we discuss trends and topics in the startup world. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Investor Connect is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors and startups for fundraising. Please consider donating $100 to the program to help others in their investor and entrepreneur journey. You can find the donate button on the InvestorConnect.org website. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalia Wilson, and welcome to KiwiTech's Angel Investors Panel. We are very excited to have Ted Capital Network as our event partner. We can't thank them enough for their immense support for this event and for overall contribution to the startup ecosystem. As we get started, I would also like to take a moment and say thank you that we greatly appreciate all of your overwhelming responses for this event. Today, we have a fantastic panel discussion followed by five premium startup pitches. I'm also joined by my colleague, Paridi Agrawal. The two of us will serve as the moderator of the day. With that, I would like to invite Ike Sayers, SVP Strategic Partnerships at KiwiTech to give a quick overview of the company. Over to you, Ike. Well, good morning, good afternoon, folks, depending on which part of the world you are calling in from today. As Natalia mentioned, my name is Ike. I'm the Senior Vice President for Strategic Partnerships here for KiwiTech in the Washington, D.C. area. For those of you who don't, may not know much about us, we'll just take a few minutes and share a little bit more background on Kiwi Tech. So at Kiwi Tech, we are a global community of innovators, enterprises, investors, as well as startups. With more than 500 companies in our portfolio, we are in pretty much every single vertical that you can imagine. Deep tech, fintech, biotech, with more than 3,000 investors in our network and more than 200 mentors. We have provided more than $100 million of technology services as an in-kind equity investment. I'll talk more about that in the next couple of slides. And we have helped our portfolio companies raise an additional $100 million in capital. We host more than 100 events annually, such as the one that you see today. Many of it used to be in person. With the ongoing pandemic, we have switched to a virtual format, but hopefully go back to in-person methods soon. So a little bit about our background and how we got here. So in 2012, the founders of Kiwi Tech scaled one of the largest digital media publishing companies and sold it. The following year, our startup uh, program came about. Over the next four years, as we built the ecosystem, we started our demo days, a precursor of the one that you are in today. At that point, we had built a portfolio to more than 100 companies. In 2019, we expanded overseas, outside of North America. And in the last two years, we have acquired a graphite financial accounting and management, tax management company out of uh, New York, launched our crowdfunding services, looking to acquire more companies. And the idea over the next two years is to acquire more than a thousand companies, portfolio companies in in total, as well as having several exits, over a hundred million dollar exits for our hundred portfolio companies. So what does the ecosystem look like? The way our methodology works is that we provide up to half of our service in the kind of, in the form of in-kind development. So let's take an example of an early stage startup that has half a million dollars of project development needs. That's just an example. There are no minimums or maximums. So we will take half of that up to $250,000 in the form of cash. And the other half we will take in the form of equity at the company's current valuation. For early stage startups, again, a great way to save capital, to get a term sheet in play, to talk to an independent third-party investor like us, as well as take advantage of our investor ecosystem. The deal flow is quite selective. Over the last two years, as an example, we spoke to more than 122,000 companies. About half of them, we were able to get beyond the first discussion. Out of that, almost a quarter, we had a meeting with their CEO. And almost a quarter of that, we went forward with the term sheet phase ended up with a final pick of slightly over 300 companies. So you can see we are quite selective in terms of who we work with. We do like to work with top-notch entrepreneurs. Essentially, it is the team that we are backing, especially for our companies that are early stage. The ecosystem is quite diversified, made up obviously of our portfolio companies, our investor networks, but also our incubators, accelerators, and corporate connections. Our technology team is more than 500 strong. I mentioned the Graphite Financial Acquisition and the equity crowdfunding platform that we're looking to create. As well, we have centers of excellence around emerging markets, crypto, as well as blockchain. And really the idea there is through people like myself, build partnerships on the ground, 
and then use our ecosystem to expand our global capabilities. The events are quite diverse. Obviously, we have the event today. In addition, we have family office panels, so other investor asset classes, institutional venture capital panel. We have our communities such as blockchain, other industry verticals. And then we also have a proud history of giving back to the historically underserved communities, such as our Female Founders Day, Black Entrepreneurs Matter, and Hispanic Founders. So super excited about the event today for the Angel Investors Panel. Have a great lineup of investors coming and speaking during the panel discussion. Excited to hear from them. I really appreciate their time. Wonderful startups coming and pitching to investors. Good luck to all of them. Back to you, Natalia. Now, I would like to welcome our panel moderator, Haldi Martin, founder and CEO at Ten Capital Network, to kickstart the panel discussion on everything you need to know about aerospace investing. Thank you, Natalia. My name is Hall Martin with Ten Capital, and today we have a great panel. It's going to talk about everything you need to know about aerospace investing. And with that, let's go ahead and bring on our panelists today. First up, we'll have each one introduce themselves, and then we'll go forward with uh, the discussion. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box, and we'll see if we have time to answer those as well. First up, we have Giuseppe Liberati. Giuseppe, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your firm and what you do? Yeah, I'll, well, um, I'm Giuseppe Liberati. I'm, like, uh, I'm the founder of Bridging Value. We are a team of business developers addressing the challenges of the energy matrix transformation. And um, in this area, we look at complex challenges. You know, energy is something that has triggered a lot of issues these days. So let's not go in there now. But in that area, we look at companies that are across different networks and different verticals. So we look across technologies. And in most of the time when we're working with our clients, we find gaps, a lot of gaps. And we start scouting for different startups. In that space, and I got involved with the Houston Angel Network. I don't know if anybody in the in line uh, knows that, but it's one of the most, actually it is, the most active angel network in the country. And in that area, I am one of the board members and, and the head of the aerospace committee. At present, we have a portfolio of about 12 different startups within our company, and uh, we're, we're mentoring more, more of them uh, globally. Uh, right now, for example, I'm speaking to you guys from, uh, from Madrid, Spain. And I'm very much involved in the ecosystems over here and uh, building those bridges. It's actually what the future looks like. So, yes, I'm all an actor. And, uh, thank you for having me here today. Thank you all. Thanks, Giuseppe. Next, we have Greer Carper. Greer, can you turn on your video and tell us a little bit about yourself and your work that you're doing? Hello, everyone. Uh, Greer Carper. I'm with a Boeing Applied Innovation, probably known as Boeing Horizon X Ventures. We're a Boeing's corporate capital arm. And so we make uh, investments into uh, startups and small companies that are uh, have an interest or have a desire to get into some place within the aerospace uh, ecosystem. For us, we're a strategic venture capital fund, which means that we are looking at a hypothesis besides just an attractive return on investment. Uh, instead, asking is there a mutually beneficial opportunity for both the startup and for Boeing to work together to achieve whatever intended outcomes that we may envision. Recently, we announced a partnership with our CBC activities with a, a private equity fund called Air Equity Industrial Partners out of Boca Raton, Florida. They are an aerospace and defense middle market uh, private equity shop uh, that wanted to expand into venture capital. And so uh, we have a, this partnership where going forward, we'll be making uh, investments through them as an entity. And for my role with Boeing Applied Innovation as that primary interface with Air Equity, we're fighting startups to invest in, engage with those startups, asking tough questions as to what that value proposition may be between the startup and Boeing, and working with AEI to make investments into these companies. The last thing I had mentioned, and this is uh, fairly common with a lot of CBCs out there, is that our team is also responsible for those post-close activities. Just because a startup receives a large investment from a big corporation doesn't mean the corporation is actually going to do much with them. Boeing and other entities interact with many companies and many startups and small entities, medium-sized entities. And so we have a team of internal liaisons, if you will, which is the team that I'm on that works with the startup and trying to realize that hypothesis that we put together when we make that initial investment. I'm happy to be here and uh, appreciate the invitation. I'm looking forward to the panel. Great. Thanks, Greer. 
We did have a question from the audience. Uh, the question is, as a first-time founder, what is the best way to contact an angel if you do not already have them in your network? Giuseppe, you want to give us a first pass on that one? Sure. The first thing I would say, never be shy and uh, start asking questions. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't have somebody directly in your network, but somebody that you know in your network might know an angel. Then the other things I say, look for an angel network that is actually aligned with your approach, what you're looking for. And there's a lot of things that angel networks can actually be very strong. The best thing you can get out of an angel network is a lot of advisors. And so one of the things I say for us at Houston Angel Network, you just simply go to our webpage and you can apply. And we don't charge anything to apply and, uh, you know, get you into our pipeline. Start working with us. You know, if you have a very interesting company and interesting value propositions, for sure, we'll get to talk to you. Well, great. And Greer, what's your take on that question? If you want to modify it for your group, that's fine too. Yeah, I may have to as sort of a nuance. As a CVC, we typically invest from seed stage to series B and angels are usually coming in a lot earlier than, than that. But we engage with angel networks, be it individual angels or entities like Kiwi Tech or Ten Capital for, for that matter, that allow us to get that kind of deal flow so that we can find those startups to invest in later on. You can engage through cold you know, emails or, or other interactions, be it you know, uh, finding them at conferences or events like these, but leverage your networks. And if you are going after a, a given industrial sector like aerospace, start to think about how am I going to build out my network within that given space? Because it's, that network's not just about trying to find perhaps access to that angel or perhaps a board member or a board advisor. Uh, it, it's about trying to understand how does that market operate? Is this really the right market to go into? And an angel that knows this space is most certainly going to be able to provide tremendous perspective on what pitfalls can be in going after a regulated market like aerospace. And so be proactive in reaching out, utilize your networks, find individuals that can can help expand and broaden that network, also that you can better understand who to engage and and who to to, uh, try to build up that network accordingly. Great, thanks. So let's talk about aerospace in particular. What do you guys see as the main trend in aerospace? Giuseppe, why don't you kick it off there with what you see going on? Well, the biggest trend has been uh, up to a few weeks ago, the fact that uh, you know private companies are accessing more and more the, the, the space. And so we are seeing a blossoming condition of like companies everywhere looking at different, different alternatives. If you think about this, we had a an interesting panel discussion uh, with the Houston Angel Network. And my friend, George Pullen, who's actually a space economy professor, he's, he mentioned that right now in LEO, so the low Earth orbit, we have approximately the size of the economy of Brazil floating on top of us. So imagine like expanding the world economy by uh, one of the 10th, 11th economy of the world, like flowing up there. So that's actually a lot of wealth. Now, we're seeing a lot of companies investing and uh, developing uh, launching systems. Obviously, everybody knows SpaceX and then uh, all the other friends and foes in that space. But now we have to do, what are we going to do in space? So we're talking about lots of production and start manufacturing in space, start storing things in space. And so there's things that we don't even know yet. I was just reading today about a company called Inversion Space, for example, they are planning of storing human organs in space that will be directly shipped or dropped, if you want, to hospitals to bring them, you know, at the moment of the transplant is needed. Would I have thought about that? No. So there's a lot of things that are going to happen out there. And there's obviously, these days we're looking more on the, the military and the defense kind of situations and data is actually relevant. Hey, there's so many things that we don't even know yet. That's great. And Greer, what's your take on the main trend you see going on today? When I look at what's going on now versus perhaps three or four years ago, I'd say three or four years ago, it was perhaps around autonomy and electrification, which are still quite popular topics. But if you believe the Gartner hype cycle curve, we're very much seeing kind of that, that downward trend to delusion. But I'll say today, sustainability is a huge area of interest. And it's because unlike perhaps even two or three years ago, in the commercial aviation, the, the industry and the airlines are all trying to ask the question of how do we be part of the wide solution space that is in dealing with uh, climate change. And so that's not just around, you know, how do we 
create uh, better outcomes in terms of, of carbon footprint. It, there's also most certainly a, an efficiency play in terms of more efficient engines, more efficient operations, more efficient fuels, more sustainable fuels for that matter. And so that's not just around a single technology set, but around the unique challenges that exist in certifying aircraft and engines operating these aircraft within the existing airspace construct and being able to understand those nuances and where small changes within the space could actually yield some pretty significant benefits. Besides sustainability, I'll say that digital twin and digital thread are most certainly areas in both manufacturing and in the maintenance space that are becoming a, a, a lot uh, more interesting and have a lot more focus in how do we create not just better safety outcomes in the production and maintenance of these systems, but can also increase efficiencies when it comes to uh, sourcing and assembling these very complex machineries to perform their various transportation outcomes. Those are the kind of two that come to my mind. Great. Thanks, Greer. And we have an additional panelist, Rick Tumlinson. Rick, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your fund? Yeah, I, we have a small fund, Space Fund, and I'm um, wearing the advertisement right here. And we are basically focused on startups. I've been in the field a long, long time and spent a lot of time trying to help launch what we call the space revolution that's happening. Coined the term new space a few years ago to help sort of identify this market, this sector. And the idea of Space Fund is to focus in on these kinds of startups that are what we call frontier enabling. These are largely companies that are going to be making up the industrial infrastructure of what we hope will be an expansion of civilization into space. Now, that big goal put aside, we're very, very hardcore in a sense in our way of looking at companies. And so we focus in on companies that have very, very, uh, you know, make those, have those basic fundamentals. And yeah. We're really excited about what's going on. We have 19 companies in our portfolios right now. We're very lucky to say, or happy to say, or knock on wood, they're, they're all doing great. So we have a question from the audience, Rick, that we'll start with you and then ask the others. And the question is, what kind of fund structures do you see for funds focused on space? For example, do space funds have to be more patient when compared to a B2B or SaaS-focused fund? Or are they looking out longer than 10 years? Yeah, very interesting question. And we've encountered that quite a bit with Space Fund itself. I think it's a combination. And I think that gets down to sort of the the structure of the decision process in terms of what you're going to be investing in. There are certain elements of space infrastructure type of funds or startups that, for example, we love to find companies that have terrestrial, what we call terrestrial revenue sources, or what NASA might have in the old days, called spinoffs or or whatever. They're making money now, or something they're going to do is going to make money near term. That gives you a shorter window. But when you get into the longer stuff, you know, I I started one of the two asteroid mining companies. We were a little too early. And we look at time horizons when you're talking about resource development, hard infrastructure, mass infrastructure, those time windows are much, much longer. So it is a combination. And I think that can kind of be defined in the fund itself, you know, when you're reading the prospectus or, or, or the documentation they put out. Hey, thanks. And Greer, what's your take on that? What do you see as the structure of these funds? And especially from a corporate VC point of view, how do you manage that? Well, I'll tell you, space is not one of my areas of expertise, but I must really agree with Rick's comments around terrestrial revenue sources. Much like the commercial aviation or even the military for that matter, there is a time horizon of what it takes to actually get up there a schedule that it's not fixed, but it most certainly is is measured in months and not weeks and days. And yet, as a startup, you're going to be in a position where you're constantly managing cash flow. And if it's going to take you three or four years to build a Leo constellation to provide the outcome that you're looking to provide to your customers, then you're going to need a lot of cash to get there. And there are some startups that can raise that kind of money, but it's a challenging one. And all it takes is perhaps one or two schedule slippages because the launch service that you thought was going to be there is no longer available or has been delayed due to weather events or what have you. All of this are huge considerations because you're spending a lot of money just to to get there. And so what I'd say is, is that like Rick, terrestrial revenue sources are really interesting because it's a way, it's a stopgap, if you will. I also say, at least from a defense standpoint, we're seeing in the United States a number of 
these companies pursuing these new fund matching programs like AFWRC with Stratify, or alternatively, NASA announced their uh, version of Stratify back in December of this year. These are non-dilutive fund matching sources. And so if you raise so much money, $5 million, if you meet their criteria, you may get another $5 million from those entities to incentivize you to stay within those markets and to keep going. There's a lot of excitement there. It's easier said than done. There's only a fraction of companies that have been successful with it. But those clever ways that you can keep that cash runway extended are things that we like to see. Raising capital from angels or from VCs or CVCs like myself is one avenue. But as a founder, you need to be clever. And if you can find clever ways of doing it without deluding yourself, then I think that's a good strategy. Great. Thanks. And Giuseppe, what's your take on structuring a fund for a space application? Well, building on what we're in and Rick said, like, you know, first of all, patience is fundamental. So you have to be very patient. And from an angel, an angel perspective, it's actually not simple to make other networks or other partners in our common sport of investing, invest in something that does not have that for industrial beachhead market, at least. Now, one thing that is interesting, though, is that the challenges of space are extremely technically, you know, technically dense, let's put it this way. And so one of the things that we are looking at is that in oftentimes it has happened to me and has happened to other friends. We try to recommend companies to not just go on a journey on their own. Start looking at partnering up. Try to, you know, become like, you know, if you see that, you know, in order to for you to get some solutions out of space, you might need that infrastructure piece, or you might need other components, or you might need other things that, you know, create that ecosystem. Now, if you start thinking ecosystem, not just your individual company, now you're going to find partners. And now building like one plus one, oftentimes, if you're really going to what Greg just said, if you're very smart and very active and very positive about your technology or your company, well, you're going to find a way to make one plus one equal three instead of <laughs> zero point something. So yes, patience, open mind and really willingness to go the extra miles. Hey, next question for all three of you is, do you mostly rely upon deal flow based on your network or do you also have proprietary deal flow? You know, are there specific type of companies you look for in terms of size or capabilities? Let's start with Greer. What do you think about that? We'll take deal flow where we can find it. And I'd also mention that for us, we are taking in this deal flow into account. We're engaging our internal networks, which is to say our our technical subject matter experts, our program managers, our business development leads, and asking the questions of, of what we have to believe in order to be successful in whatever customer set and problem that that given startup may be tackling. That's a bit unique to us as a CVC and other CVCs that are more strategic in nature, which we're asking that kind of question of where that alignment may be. But there are a lot of great uh, publicly available venues from accelerators and incubators to other kinds of co-working spaces that provide an opportunity for startups to be exposed to many different entities within aerospace. We, we find it where we can find it. Great. And Rick, what can you say about your deal flow process? Yeah, I, similar answer. I, I, but also the new space or the new commercial space field is so small. We're still almost uh, at, at the leadership level. It's almost like small town, right? And so you hear stories and you run into people and you hear about somebody who's left. You know, it's funny. I, I just talked to some guys that were starting up a company and two young guys, and they proudly announced on their deck that they had a combined 10 years of experience in the space field. <laughs> we realized, okay, well, one of them interned at Virgin Galactic and one interned at SpaceX, you know, but uh, the great idea, but they're out there. One of our partners, Megan Crawford, we call her the startup whisperer. She's been running one of the longest ever space business plan competitions. So she's got her fingers on the pulse there. And it's sort of my job is to then do the, what we call the BS, no BS call, where we call, you know, the people that have been around a while and say, okay, does this apply? You know, little questions of laws of physics, things like that, and follow up on it. But the deal flow itself, and I should say this, when we started, it was a big question. Where are we going to get the deal flow? Well, we know all these people. Now, you know, now people know who we are. They're just pouring through the website. They're coming at us from every direction. It's like a bad zombie movie. We got so many of them coming at us. So. Understood. And uh, Giuseppe, what's your take uh, on that as far I, as that goes? I like what Rick is saying. And by the way, I'm uh, with 
with Han, we had uh, Megan as one of our panelists. So, right, and we know how Megan is, and that you know really how she talks to people, and she actually is very. It's amazing listening to her. For us, the deal flow is actually, as everybody said, comes from every angle. One thing that we're really working now heavily is really connecting with the universities and trying to really capture those projects before, uh, you know, with the technology transfer departments. I'm part of the materials department advisory board of the Colorado School of Mines. And let me tell you a little bit of that story. That's a little bit of my alma mater. On mines, there's a lot of technology. It's an engineering school. And they, each department was working independently. And all of a sudden, they had a visit from NASA said, guys, we need this, this, and this because we're going to start mining different materials on the moon and on uh, different uh, asteroids. But you guys have everything. You have the engineering. You have the chemical engineering. You got all the mining. You got the metallurgy department. Why didn't you guys have a space program? So this is kind of funny because sometimes in space, we're trying to solve the same problems we might be solving on Earth with a different level of complexity. But at a certain point, talking to each other, that's when you clash the idea, and the clashing of ideas is that when you have things happening. So again, answering deal flow, deal flow comes from every angle. We're looking at a university. We try to be at the head before companies come out, but ultimately is really be able to understand if what people are proposing makes sense and they don't break the second law of physics. Great. So the next one's more of a technical question. And what is the future of work and the role of machine language and artificial intelligence in space and aerospace? Are there any industry comparisons you can make? I guess we're asking what is the applications and how far along <laughs> is it developed? Greer, you want to start off with that? Yeah, this is a fun one because this is an area that I have a decent amount about. So most of my focus in aerospace and defense is, is around autonomy and AI machine learning. And so I think commercial aviation for uh, autonomous aircraft, from large aircraft to packed delivery vehicles to, to military use cases around swarming or ISR, TC pet workflow kinds of stuff. I'll give you one example of the challenges within this space. Uh, you know, I'll start with commercial aviation. And, and that is, there is a small subset within machine learning, which in turn uh, called deep learning, which is a technology area that has a tremendous amount of interest right now and one that, that really didn't exist 10 years ago, but in terms of popularity, ubiquity as it has now. But the use of deep learning is a challenge within aviation because aviation is built on a set of, of rules and standards. And, and that includes things like software assurance. When you look at DO 178 as a standard, it asks for the most safety critical design considerations to be 10 to minus ninth in terms of, of reliability. That is a, a huge number. And it explicitly calls out that any kind of software and algorithms that are used have to be deterministic. Well, deep learning is, is non-deterministic in, in how it's formed. And so entities that want to use this new bleeding edge technology, deep learning for aviation use cases, including safety of flight. And yet the regulators have no way of reconciling this with the current standards. And so you have a number of entities that are trying to change and shape those standards. And that's a journey and it's a long one. And if you have the cash flow and the runway to be able to, to withstand that journey, then good on you. But when you look at how long it takes to get even a small amount of regulations changed or updated, it's measured in years, if not decades. I think everyone in the drone space had thought that it would be a lot more mature than it is now. It's because it's taken a lot longer to get these rules created and getting consensus and getting feedback and thinking about all those considerations therein. I most certainly think AI and machine learning have use cases within this, but if you are a company that is using AI machine learning, particularly around deep learning for safety, kind of critical use cases, be careful. Understand how the, not just the customers, but the various stakeholders involved think about this new technology and whether or not uh, that may be a, a roadblock for you to generate the value that you are trying to create. Great. Thanks, Greer. And Rick, what's your take on machine language and uh, machine learning and AI in the space application space? Do you see a lot of it uh, being used or do you think it's uh, still far way off? No, I think by necessity, it's going to be, you know, look, because of the life support requirements of human beings, that additional infrastructure load that you put on your cost is extremely high. And so it comes down to, in a sense, you have to make the decision of, you know, you're sending people basically because you want to, right? And because they want to go and it has something to do with your core mission, your core activity is about humans being in space. The 
end of that spear, the end of that activity chain, whatever you want to call it, though, for example, I'll give you this. We were talking about asteroid mining. Okay, when you get into asteroid mining, on the one hand, having AI and those kinds of capabilities is super important because you're going to be able to, you know, you're going to have time lags, you're going to have robotics out there. There's the time lags and decisions. And those moments are when a robotic vehicle or, or machine or whatever can go off, off the rails unless there's some sort of AI component on the other end before you tell it, don't turn left, you know, don't turn right, there's a cliff, whatever, these kinds of things. And at the same time, the flip side of that is AIs and machines, you know, I, one of the jokes we had in our company was the idea of, have you ever watched one of these mining shows on the History Channel? Because if you have, you'll notice that about three quarters of the show is the machine breaking down or a rock getting caught in something. (laughs) And that requires a human with a hammer, right? So it's a blend. But absolutely, the leveraging impact where you're going to have, you know, it's probably not going to be either or. It's going to be, you're going to be multiplied, almost like a force multiplier type situation. One person overseeing a hundred robots that are doing something on the far side of the moon or something like that. Great. Giuseppe, what's your take? Where do you see AI and ML making inroads into the space, aerospace sector? Well, the basic things that we're doing, so the beach and markets and, you know, the terrestrial anchor businesses that we're talking to startups is mostly data-driven. So we're collecting a lot more data from out there and then we're using it for application we never thought, you know, in the past we, we needed them. You know, I'm mentoring a company right now. They're, design, they're changing the real estate appreciation and valuation of units and land by just integrating aerospace data. You know, instead of having somebody going out in the field, they're doing that. So we're going to have, so AI and machine learning, particularly, let's say, let's not mix them because they're different, a different way of separating them anyway. And the application of data, data management and data extracting value from data is going to be extremely important, no matter what. Building on what Rick was saying is actually very interesting because Imagine like a fleet of uh, robots or dr- of uh, rovers on a different planet. One of the things that's interesting is that you have to create a system like on an edge computing system that can actually take decisions locally. Now we're like, you know, we're not, especially with the delay that we have in sending information from to outer space, we cannot be right there right at that time. So definitely we need to do, we'll be leveraging more and more of this, of this information. For uh, additionally on that, a few, like it was about a year and a half ago, there's been one of the first ever transaction, uh, financial transaction that was mocked, I think, from JP Morgan between two satellites, acting if the two satellites were two different entities exchanging some financial activities. And, you know, and they they used, obviously, a crypto base. So blockchain, as a technology in the background, is actually used for transaction. You cannot, you don't expect to bring your coins or your jar of coins and and builds and stuff in space, you know, it'll be a little complicated. So that's another angle that we need to definitely need to start looking at. Great. So we have another fun question. And the question is, what's your sense of the space-focused VC landscape? Are there enough VCs at different stages out there investing in space or are there too few? And where do you think the gaps or opportunities are for fund managers considering a space-focused fund? Greer, let's start with you on that. I mostly think that the number of, of space-focused VCs is growing, which I think is a positive thing. But I, I also would say that I fear that the space-focused VCs may be in for a similar kind of ride than what we saw currently when it comes to the drone space. You had a lot of VCs that were going after drones and autonomy, and a lot of them are getting cold feet now because we're starting to see that those first large fundraising success stories become failures, unfortunately. And so when those assumptions around around regulatory adoption and timing and scale begin to slip the right. A lot of investors get there as well. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen with the space focus. And I'll let my two panelist colleagues speak to kind of the trends in, in that respect. But I would be concerned about those kind of things just from my own experience. Great. And Rick, what do you see out there with the uh, VC funds? Where are the gaps? Where are the opportunities? There are actually only a very, very few pure space funds, less than five, I think, that I know of, that are 100% space, that don't have drones, that don't have other things in their mix. I see a couple of countervailing trends going on. One of them is that the we found in our fund, space has a very interesting angle to it in that 
the people that, that want to invest in space are often, you know, they're trekkers, they're space nerds, they're geeks, they love space. And for them, the idea of the interface with the actual company is where the fun is. Like they want to be able to play directly with the company. They want to call the CEO. They want to, you know, either be helpful or be a pain, depending on which way you look at it as far as the company goes. But they want hands-on. So when it comes to investing in a fund, that creates a one-step remove for them. And one of our challenges has been to get those kinds of people to come into our fund. It's been a real challenge because they want to go straight to the company. They don't want to have to deal with us. So we have to make it, I don't want to say so much fun, but we have to make it interesting for them. And we have to engage the actual investors in the LPs that we do, or the LPs that we're dealing with. So that's one of our big challenges, frankly, is is this the excitement of like, I want to play in space. And, you know, <laughs> rather than here, give us your money and we'll do that for you. You know, the time constraints as far as uh, being able to look at these long windows. I think Greer is highlighting something in drones will run into in space and that there's going to be a growth of excitement, reality hits, those who don't have the stomach for it, those, we have several crypto people that I've engaged with. I'm going to say this real carefully. I don't want to upset anybody, but there, there are crypto people that we have had engagements with in our funds, and they were basically looking for immediate satisfaction. They're looking for quick. They want to ride this baby. And these are people, you know, that check their Bitcoin account, you know, every 30 seconds and have alerts, you know. And so space is so diametrically different. It's like, okay, just relax, you know. Just relax. Don't look at your watch. Look at your calendar. You know, it's that kind of thing. So, hey, thanks. And Giuseppe, what's your take on that? Uh, where do you see the opportunities? There's two different uh, ways uh, I like to take that question. And so the first one is that compare space to any other industry, you know, any other industry that we know, let's say logistic or transportation, or let's say mobility and so on and earth. Like, you know, you have a certain point five number. And how many funds are there? So take that ratio and apply that to an economy that is still in the process of making. So I, as Rick says, there's not a lot of funds that are just purely space. But ultimately, the ultimate goal is that space needs infrastructure. We'll need like transportation. We'll need other, other verticals. So we'll be kind of like an enabler. So if the funds are going to be enablers or those extension of the verticals that we already know on Earth. So if you're looking at it from that perspective, I don't know if I would go in 100% fun in space at this time. I will try to look at what are the verticals that are going to expand into space so they can actually have a beneficial effect on space, linking back to that terrestrial anchorage, let's put it this way. And so if you want to start your own fund, don't forget about space. Consider it into the matrix, but don't limit yourself just in space. Great. Well, thank you, guys. We are at the end of our time. We'll appreciate your time, your experience, and your wisdom that you shared with us today. Paul T. Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. 